song selection our praise team has put together for this morning. Uh, and I, I was just thinking about the last song we sang uh, before our lighting of the Advent candle. And it talked about the person I once was. Aren't you glad this morning you can take a moment and reflect on your personal history and remember the person you once were, the person you are not now? And the beautiful, wonderful change and transformation God has made in your heart and life, in my heart and life, because I am no longer the person I once was because of Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. And you might be wondering this morning, Pastor Ricky, it's Advent. Why are we singing so many songs about salvation and, and redemption and forgiveness of sins and new life in Christ Jesus? Well, that is a great question, and the answer is we're going to read again in Mark's Gospel today, and we're going to see where Joseph was told to call his son Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. The sinless, spotless Lamb of God has chosen to save us from our sins. And I don't know about you this morning, but in my heart and mind, that shouting ground. Did you know we used to be called probably 150 years ago the shouting Methodist? I learned that in seminary. I, I learned one good thing in seminary, whether anything else or not, Shouting Methodist. Hey, there you go. I'm so glad that Gunnersville First has taken up the mantle of reviving that truth in our church. Because we can shout about football games and baseball games and, and everything else in the world, but why would we not be shouting about Jesus? Yes, why would we not be shouting about Jesus? The world needs to hear the church shouting about Jesus again. Leaping and proclaiming praises to God. Like that guy in the temple back in the early chapters of the book of Acts. He had never walked and God worked through Peter and John and healed him. Nobody had to teach him how to walk, run, jump, leap. He leaped in the temple, and he proclaimed praises to God. When the Holy Spirit came in Acts chapter 2 and filled all of those gathered in the upper room, the Bible said it just could not contain them. They poured out of the upper room into the street, and Luke records that they proclaimed the mighty works of God. Why isn't the church doing that to the level it should be this morning? Because we've got much for which to shout. And I want to tell you, the content of this morning's sermon is shouting ground. And I hope you feel the same. And, and I just hope this morning that your heart and your soul is stirred by God's Holy Spirit. The peace that was lost in the Garden of Eden with that first sin has been restored through Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. And we rejoice in that today as we celebrate the peace of God with us and within us. So we're going back to Matthew 1, 18 through 25, as we talk about this morning, Jesus Savior. Now the birth of Jesus Christ took place in this way. When his mother Mary had been betrothed to Joseph, before they came together, she was found to be with child from the Holy Spirit. And her husband Joseph, being a just man and unwilling to put her to shame, resolved to divorce her quietly. But as he considered these things, behold, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream, saying, Joseph, son of David, do not fear to take Mary as your wife, for, what, for that which is conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. Now hear this, church. She will bear a son... And you will call his name Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. All this took place to fulfill what the Lord had spoken by the prophet. 
Behold, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel, which means God with us. When Joseph woke from sleep, he did as the angel of the Lord commanded him. He took his wife, but he knew her not until she had given birth to a son, and he called his name Jesus. Say that one more time. Jesus. Maybe once more. Jesus. One more. Jesus. Don't you know that just sounds wonderful in the Lord's ears this morning? That his church, the bride of Christ, his children would be calling out his name with such love and passion and sincerity. Jesus. Jesus, Jesus. One of the greatest statements of truth that a person could make about themselves is this. I need a Savior. I need a Savior. Say that once with me. I need a Savior. You see, this is the kind of atmosphere that makes a preacher want to preach because you're responding and, and you're speaking out and, you know, that just gets the Holy Spirit moving because I like interactive preaching. That means I'm not the only one engaged. You're engaged, I'm engaged, Holy Spirit's engaged, and, and, and it, that's just how it's supposed to be. I mean, when we think about what engages us, we think about the good news of the gospel of Jesus Christ, we think about that point in our lives, and maybe you're there this morning, that I realized, you realized, we realized, I need a Savior. Because there's some things broken in my heart and in my life that need to be repaired, that need to be fixed, restored, replaced. Whatever the case may be, I need a Savior. And when we hear the good news of the gospel of Jesus Christ, we find that God has met us once again at the point of our need. God looked down at the children of His creation, the crown jewel, and saw they need a Savior. Oh, the law was good, it helped, but they needed more than the law. They needed what the law pointed to and his name is Jesus. So in the fullness of time, in God's heart and mind in that correct moment he sent Jesus into this world through that precious young lady, Mary, and into this world was born Jesus. He will save them from their sins. He will save his people from their sins. I hope you know this morning you have no hope in saving yourself from your sins. So this morning we need to rest assured all of our hope for salvation and forgiveness of sins and victory over sin comes in and through Jesus Christ our Lord and Savior. Because we've been touched by, the, by sin to the very core of our being. You go all the way back to the Garden of Eden and when Adam and Eve took of the fruit of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, the, the tree that God forbade them to eat from, do not go there, do not do that, when they disobeyed God, when they rebelled against God and they partook of that fruit and they sinned, it touched them to the core of their being. Spirit, soul, and body, sin entered in and began to destroy and disrupt God's creation in Adam and Eve. That spiritual connection was lost. And those who were spiritually alive suddenly became spiritually dead or disconnected from God in that moment. And they felt a difference in themselves. They suddenly saw and noticed that they were naked and they ran and hid from God because something was different. Not only was their spirit disconnected, but their soul was polluted. A, a mind, a will, an emotion that, that was once in harmony with God and was once an expression of the heart, mind, and will of God now had begun to take its own course. And then that body in which they lived began slowly to deteriorate until death took them out. Oh, it was a long time down the road, but they died a physical death. They had a spiritual death and a, and a death taking place in their soul. And it touched every aspect of their being. But the Bible tells us, the Word of God tells us this morning, she will bear a son and you will call his name Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. 
Oh, God knew the, the peace that was lost in the Garden of Eden would one day, one day be restored through Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. Why? Because he will save his people from their sins. What does it mean to be saved? It means to save, that is to deliver or to protect spirit, soul, and body. Salvation covers our entire being. What is sin? Do y'all know what sin is? Yes, we've touched it, we've experienced it, we've embraced it, we have thrown it away, we've been polluted by it. We are intimately aware of our sin, as the Bible indicates we are, and as life experience indicates we are. Sin in its simplest form means to miss the mark or to miss the way. Sometimes we sin with sins of commission. That's things we did that we knew we shouldn't do. Have you ever done that? Something inside of you said, don't do it. Don't say it. Don't say it. Our mouths are get us in trouble all the time. Don't say it. And you said it anyway. And then you thought, oh, I knew I shouldn't have said that. But there was some appeal to saying it. You, you're going to feel better if you told them how you felt about that. And, and something said, don't do it. Don't do it. And you did it, and then you had to repent and ask God to forgive you and whatever else God required. And then there's those moments in life that you knew you should have done something and you didn't do it. You should have stopped and gave that guy on the side of the road a little bit of money to get lunch. And if you didn't like giving him money, go down to Burger King and get him a Big Mac. No, that's McDonald's. Uh, get him a Whopper and, you know, and, and take him something if you don't want to give him money. You know, and you didn't, and it haunted you the rest of the day. You know, I've had that to happen to me a time or two in life. And I'd go back and try to find the person, and they'd be gone. And I'd say, oh, well, here you go. There's nothing you can do about it now. But there's those moments in life that we should have done something and we didn't. Sins of omission. And when we look in the Bible, the Bible really talks clearly about how deeply we are affected and impacted by sin. And one of my favorite places in the Old Testament is Exodus 33 and 34 where God and Moses are talking and, and Moses is saying, God, you got to go with us into the promised land. And, and God's saying, no, y'all just a bunch of stubborn, stiff-necked people. If I go with you, I'll probably just, just wipe you all out before we get there because, you know, you're just crazy. You know how you felt going to the beach and your kids got crazy on the way down there? And you thought, if I wasn't so close, I'd turn around and go back home. I remember one year, we were an hour out of Panama City, and I looked at Nona, and I said, if we weren't an hour away, I'd go back home and send every one of them to the room. But you know, don't you know God looks down at us like that sometimes? He said, I'm not going with Israel. I'll wipe them out along the way. And, and Moses said, but God, if you don't go with us, how will the people know we're your people? How will the world know we are your chosen children? And God said, okay, I'll go. But then in chapter 34, after Moses had made this great request, Lord, show us your glory, God shows Moses his hind parts. And God proclaims the name of the Lord. God describes God's self. And hear what God says. He says, The Lord, the Lord, a God merciful and gracious, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love and faithfulness, keeping steadfast love for thousands, forgiving iniquity and transgression and sin, but who will by no means clear the guilty, visiting the iniquity of the fathers on the children and the children's children to the third and the fourth generation. So God is saying this about God's self. And in that statement, God tells us something about ourselves and that he needs to forgive in us iniquity, transgression, and sin. So sin's just missing the mark or missing the way. Iniquity talks about what's going on inside of us. If you look it up in the Greek and the Hebrew and, and things like that, it talks about perversity and depravity and, and that fallenness that is you on the inside. And probably only you and God know how nasty that is. You ever heard thought, felt something inside that was just nasty. And you thought, oh my goodness, where did that come from? You and your sin nature and your iniquity? Or something happened in life and, oh man, you, you just wanted to respond in this fashion and it, and it wouldn't Christ-like. Let me tell you one I have. I'm going down the highway with my family in my vehicle and somebody cuts me off in traffic. 
and, and I, you, know, you want to know what I want to do? I want to pull up beside them and I want to bash them off into the ditch. And I used to tell my kids, and well, I didn't say it to them, but I said it to Nona. I, I said, you know, one of these days I'm going to go buy an old pickup truck. And I'm going to weld a bumper all the way around it, all four sides. And I'm just going to go cruising. And when that nut pulls out in front of me and cuts me off, it's going to be his day. I'm going to take him out. I'm going to put him in the ditch. And I'm just going to keep driving. How many of you know this morning that's not of God? <laughs> it didn't take me long to figure out that is not of God. Okay, but that is iniquity. That is sin at work in us, trying to compel us to outward works of sin, which is transgression or sin. Transgression is the breaking of God's law. Thou shalt not bear false witness. Thou shalt not lie. Thou shalt not commit adultery. Like the big ten, you know, there's several of those that are thou shalt not. If you break one of those, you have transgressed the law. So here in this proclamation of who God says God is, he says, I am here to forgive iniquity and transgression and sin. So God wants to cover all the bases in us that needs to be covered in delivering us from our sin condition because we know how deep it goes inside of us how deep it's rooted in and God wants to deal with it all the way down to the point of the root which is exactly what we need and the only way that can happen is through Jesus Christ our Lord and Savior every part of our lives has been touched by sin spirit soul body we need a Savior, and His name is Jesus. And you know what? When we journey through this life and we've had the opportunity to be awakened to our sin and to understand what sin is doing in our lives and the lives of others, we just get to a place of brokenness and sorrow. And we're like Paul at the end of Romans chapter 7 who said, Oh, wretched man that I am. Could you imagine the apostle Paul saying that about himself? Oh, wretched man that I am. Who will deliver me from this body? body of death. You want to know what his answer was? Jesus. 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 Temptation ever comes your way, you need to speak out loud, just softly. Jesus. Something begins to boil inside of you that's not Christ-like, you need to speak out loud. Jesus. Why? Because he came to save us from our sins. It's not a passive presence. It's an active presence. And if you want to get him active in your life, call out his name. Hey, if you want to see Ricky Smith at age of 57 move like he was 15, let one of my grandkids cry out, Pop! If I hear hurt and pain in their voice, I'll make new doors where there are no doors. You let my kids do that, my grandkids, but what do you think God does when you say, Oh, Jesus, help me, Lord. He makes ways where are there, there are no ways. Amen? You've seen that. You appreciate that. You love him for that. So, every part of our lives have been touched by sin. Now God wants to touch every part of our lives with his grace. One of my favorite phrases in the Bible is, is included in Romans chapter 5 where Paul is writing to the church at Rome and he makes this statement where sin does abound grace does much more abound what does that mean it doesn't matter how big your sin is God's grace is always bigger some people say, oh Pastor Ricky you just don't know I don't know and I don't want to know but this is what I do know your sin my sin is smaller than the grace of God and the pollution of our sin is less than the cleansing power of the precious blood of Jesus. So don't tell me what you've done or what you've thought or what you've felt. Let's talk about Jesus who can deliver us and free us and cleanse us from all those things. I love what Adam Clark said in his commentary. He's talking about Jesus, Savior. He will save his people from their sin. He said, this shall be his, great, Jesus, great business in the world, the great errand on which he has come, and that is to make an atonement for and to destroy sin. 
Deliverance from all the power, guilt, and pollution of sin is the privilege of every believer in Christ Jesus. Less than this is not spoken of in the gospel, and less than this would be unbecoming the gospel. The perfection of the gospel system is not that it makes allowances for sin, but that it makes an atonement for it. Not that it tolerates sin, but that it destroys it. You believe that? See, God didn't send Jesus to help us understand and learn how to manage our sin. He sent Jesus to help us see that in Christ our sin can be destroyed, rendered powerless in our hearts and in his, our lives as Holy Spirit rises up within us and makes manifest and visible the person and the life and the nature of Jesus Christ. Paul said, I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me. And the life I now live, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. You see, that ought to be the testimony of each and every one of us in here this morning. We serve a God who forgives iniquity and transgression and sin. In 1 John, verse number 7 and following, and here's where we're going to bring it to a close. So if our praise team wants to come back up, they're welcome to come. 1 John 1, 7 and following, But if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another, and the blood of Jesus, his Son, cleanses us from all sin. Can you say all sin this morning? All sin. Oh, isn't that sweet, church? He goes on, if we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. All unrighteousness. Church, we need a Savior. And God is sitting one, his name is Jesus. He will save his people from their sins. We just need to call upon that precious name. I think about there in the Garden of Eden, Adam and Eve took in hand a forbidden fruit and they ate it and it polluted them, spirit, soul, and body. And it separated them from God. Because of something they ate. But you know what? This morning, we get to come back to the Lord's table and take in hand the body that is Christ and the blood that is Christ. And we get to eat it and experience the grace that undoes the power of sin to the very core of who we are. God's grace is here to restore, to repair, to give new life because his name is Jesus, Savior of the world. Let us pray. Father, we thank you for the table that is before us, knowing that on the night Jesus would be betrayed, he took bread. He blessed it, he broke it, he gave it to his disciples and said, take and eat. This is my body given for you. And Father, after the meal was complete, he took the cup and he blessed it. And he gave it to his disciples and said, take and drink. This is my blood shed for you. This is the blood of the new covenant, my blood, shed for the remission of sins for many. Father, we're grateful this morning that we are among the many whose sins have been forgiven. We are among the many whom you have given new life through Jesus Christ. Your Holy Spirit lives, us, lives in us. We got saved. And we rejoice in that this morning. So Father, we just pray your blessings upon this table and upon us as we've come to receive from this table. May this bread and this juice be unto you and unto us, the body and the blood of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. And Father, we just pray you cleanse us right now of our sin that we might receive from this table in a worthy manner. 
And we thank you for all these things. For it's in Christ Jesus we pray. Amen.